Okay, everyone's logging on. I think the previous class might have ended a, a drop late, so everybody's coming on now. I'll wait just one more minute, and then we'll start. I see. Linda Hannaford, are you out there? Do you have a microphone? Where where are you from, Linda? I don't recognize your name. Are you new to the class? Or to Webishiva? Oh, okay. I apologize if I have a. Where are you? Where Where are you joining us from, Linda? Borough Park. Welcome. You've been from Borough Park. Tehillah, I am indeed recording. Okay, we'll start. In one second, let me just get this going here. What is this? Hello again, this is Rabbi Jeff Sachs of Atid and Web Yeshiva with another installment in our Jewish History series. Tonight, looking at the response to Reform Judaism and the emergence of Orthodoxy as we know it today. I mentioned last time. I mentioned last time uh, that very often the name of a group, the groups don't have the luxury of choosing their own names. Sometimes their names are given to them by uh, the other groups or associations that they are formed in opposition to. And that's actually true, that's actually true with the orthodoxy as as well. The, the term orthodoxy, uh, which literally means correct doctrine, uh, dox is from the same uh, root as doctrine, um, correct beliefs, uh, was a term that was actually first used sarcastically by, uh, by the reformers uh, in the 1790s, around the 1790s. Prior to that time, there was no uh, um, prior to that time, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing, uh, Barbara. I hope it was a joke. Um, I, uh, I, Leo uh, Zionist Haredi. Uh, uh, prior to that time, there was no need. When you're the only, uh, when you're the only show in town, you don't need a, a name to define yourselves. They were just Jews. Jews were Jews, and uh, and. Uh, that's uh, that's who they were. So in the 1790s, we have this term in in German, uh, which I'm, I'm not sure that I'll I, I'm, I'm not I can't promise that I won't butcher the uh, pronunciation. If there's somebody uh, with us that can do a better job, gesest gesest that's true, which literally means yeah, what what is it, Esther? Can you get can you help me out with that? I always thought it was Torah true Judaism. No, so that's that's a term that comes later. But this term, uh, is which is just a, a liter literal German, a literal German translation of orthodoxy, a true mm -hmm. beliefs, true beliefs. But it was used sarcastically by the reformers to refer to the orthodox by way of saying, uh, by the way of saying, they're the ones that think they have the true. True beliefs, and as the way these things happen, uh, names names stick. Um, names uh, stick. Um, uh, the idea that uh, that there's one group which is you know true to halacha, or true to uh, a certain interpretation of 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 Judaism. During the Haskala, during the nascent uh, Jewish Enlightenment that we spoke about uh, 
uh, you, you remember our discussions of uh, Moses uh, Mendelssohn and, and others. During the Haskalah, the polarization between Maskilim uh, and traditional Jews was not quite as strong as we see with the rise later of, of reform, where you really have a division uh, in, into different, different uh, denominations, different, almost even different Judaisms, uh, you know, which has had tragic impact, regardless of which, state, which, which side of the divide uh, you stand on in terms of splintering the Jewish community. In the 1830s, um, the reform movement in Germany became much more act, not just in Germany, by the way, in, 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 uh, throughout Europe, the reform, but the capital is always in, in Germany. Um, the reform movement becomes much more, uh, shall we say, uh, uh, militant, much more active. Um, in 1838, there's a struggle between Abraham Geiger, who we spoke about last time, who's really you know one of the uh, one of the granddaddies of the reform movement, uh, over the the rabbinate in the city of Breslau, uh, where he was appointed, uh, he was brought in as a I guess like a deputy rabbi or an associate rabbi to uh, uh, the the rav of the city whose name was Rav Titkin, who was a traditionalist, and this Rav Titkin is able to kind of suppress uh, Geiger for quite a long time. Um, he, he prevents him from being able to speak in the pulpit, um, and, and um, ultimately he's, he's not able to stem the tide, and he, he himself, this Rav Titkin, finally has to resign, and Geiger is successful in turning Breslau into a center of the reforms. In the 1840s, there were those conferences of the of the reform movement in order to kind of set a policy and doctrine on, a, on an array of issues. We spoke about that. We spoke about that last time. Um, and the response to orthodoxy, the response to orthodoxy, uh, I'm sorry, the response to the reform movement from the traditionalist camp, from this newly termed orthodox camp, is initially headed by the Khatam Sofer, or the Chasm Sofer, as he would have referred to himself, or of Moshe Sofer, of Moshe Sofer, who lives from 1762 to 18, to 1839. And he is really the, the first strong opponent of, of, uh, of reform. Um, you know, in the early years of reform, remember those those, con those rabbinic conferences of the reform movement in the 1840s. At that point, uh, uh, the Chassam Sofer was already dead. He passes away in 1839. Um, uh, the Chassam Sofer, as he was known after the name, you know, you know how it is. The, uh, uh, the, the different figures take on the name of their books. We refer to we refer to uh, we refer to different characters, different historical characters, not by their name, but by the title of their book, uh, so that the Chafetz Chaim becomes the Chafetz Chaim, uh, asked the name of his book. Uh, and we sometimes even almost forget the names of the people themselves. They become synonymous with uh, the works they write. So Rav Moshe Sofer, the Chatham Sofer, um, becomes the Rav of Pressburg, Hungary. Hung the reform m moves also to Hungary, um, he becomes the Rav in Pressburg uh, um, in, uh, in uh, 1806. Um, and his yeshiva becomes a center of the opposition to reform. He famously uh, appropriates this term or this, this phrase, the Pasuk in the Torah, Chadash Asur Min HaTorah. The, uh, in, in a completely disconnected context, the Torah is discussing the issue of Chadash. Chadash is, without going into the, the details of it, has to do with new wheat. There's a period of time after the wheat sprouts in which it is, uh, in which it is forbidden. There's a, there's a 
machloket in uh, Gemara. Uh, I, I, I refer to this as a posik. It's not a posik, of course. It's a statement in the Gemara about Chadash, this new wheat being forbidden for a certain period of time. Uh, uh, whether or not that prohibition is in effect min ha-Torah or midurabanan. And the, the Gemara makes the statement that Chadash, the new wheat, is forbidden min ha-Torah. And the Chatam Sofer appropriates this phrase, Chadash Osir min ha-Torah, to refer not to the new wheat, but to Chadash, to that which is, to that which is innovative, to that which is new. The Chadash is forbidden min ha-Torah. These innovations, these reforms are forbidden, he, he, he claims. And that becomes the, the slogan, as it were, of the anti-reform movement as headed by the Chatham Sofer. But of course, there's a, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great irony, because in the opposition to reform, in the opposition to change and innovation, by definition, to engage in that kind of polemic, which until now had not existed in the Jewish community, that very opposition itself is a davar chadash. That very opposition itself is a type of, of, of innovation. To be clear, the innovation that so riled the Hassan Sofer was changes in, in halacha, uh, trying to trying to um, trying to be mechadesh, to innovate things that are against both the spirit of halacha, of Jewish law, as well as the letter of the law. That's what he's opposed to. Nobody, nobody, not even the most radical uh, 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 militant right-winger thinks that halacha doesn't adapt and that halacha doesn't uh, have to be uh, evaluated and, and, and applied in innovative new ways to, to innovative situations. I mean, think about just in the realm of technology, for example. Um, the array of the way, we, the way that we uh, observe Shabbat, for example, it is almost, um, may have been unimaginable to people just a few hundred years ago. Um, the advent of electricity, uh, beyond questions of whether or not electricity constitutes a malacha, constitutes a, the use of electricity is, is forbidden on Shabbat and not forbidden on Shabbat, um, electrical devices, um, the very fact that we have electricity, that we make use of it, just changes the entire, the entire experience of Shabbat um, in, in terms of permitted and prohibited ways of warming food on Shabbat, uh, lighting, etc., etc., etc. So obviously, halacha has to adapt to modern realities, technological innovations, just one example. And whenever you live, whether you live in the year 2010 or the year 1910 or the year 1810 or the year 1710, wherever you are on the timeline, you're living in the modern era. Whenever you live, you're living on, you're living on the cutting edge of technological innovation. Um, you know, it, it's sometimes hard to imagine. We, we folks might be living in an era where those innovations happen at an accelerated rate. It could be that they're constantly accelerating. I mean, just stop and think for a second uh, how it is that we're, we're meeting right now, uh, all of us, simultaneously, from around the world, literally around the globe. We are, we are joined here together, um, uh, communicating, uh, hearing and listening to each other, seeing each other, uh, you know, all of us, some of us in our own lifetime, and if not in our lifetime, and certainly in our parents' lifetime, um, you know, the, the idea of making a phone call uh, was unimaginable. Uh, certainly a long-distance phone call. Uh, and now here we are. I mean, I remember, and I'm not so old. At least I'd like to think I'm not so old. 
I remember the first time somebody told me about email. Uh, it was not so long ago. It was in the uh, it was in the early 1990s, uh, and and a friend of mine said to me, "I just sent an email," and I said, "What's an email?" And here we are, a meeting on on Web Yeshiva. So that's a, a side point about. Uh, what exactly the opposition was to. The idea that the Hassan Sofer was opposed to everything new is, 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 clearly, not, uh, is clearly not true, but, um, but it's, it's the specific reforms to the halakhic practice which, which so riled him. But as I was saying, the, the irony, of course, is that um, the, that the Hassan Sofer's efforts and the yeshiva itself that he headed in, in Pressburg itself was something new. Uh, there was an ordered curriculum of study in the yeshiva, which was something new. There was an attempt to train rabbis in public speaking, in, in, um, in you know, kind of, this is a, um, an anachronistic use of the term, but in, in uh, leadership skills, and those types of things, which was innovative. There were communal education projects in the yeshiva. There was an attempt in the yeshiva to reach out to balabatim, to to uh, to the uh, to the uh, to, to the laypersons in the city, a, a type a peer of project, as it were. And that might also be a an an a, um, a, a uh, uh, you know, a misuse of a term. But these were all innovative things. Um, he, uh, the Hassan Sofer himself was influential in the Habsburg Royal Court in, in order to try to exercise some political influence in keeping down the, the spread of, of reform. That is also another chidush, the role of a Rosh Yeshiva serving as a type of, uh, of lobbyist um, and uh, all of these things were, were part and parcel of the innovations that were introduced in order to oppose innovations of a different sort. Uh, the Hassan Sofer, of course, was a tremendously influential figure. His Torah is, is, still, is still studied today, of course. Um, anybody that spent any time in yeshiva has encountered the Torah of the, of the Hassan Sofer, the institutions that he founded uh, still uh, still exist in the, their various uh, Gilgulim. There's a yeshiva in there's a yeshiva in Yerushalayim, uh, not far from the central bus station, uh, which is called on the side of the building. It says Pressburg on it, um, and that is a a Gilgul, as it were, of the original yeshiva in Pressburg. Um, Although the nature of the yeshiva is is uh, is somewhat different, but that building is the is the uh, is the great grandchild of the yeshiva uh, that the Hassan Sofer headed in uh, in in uh, the German colony. Uh, some of you may know a block away from Emek Rufayim. If you haven't, if you don't, those of you that aren't in in uh, in Israel probably have visited at some point, I hope you visited at some point, and you probably made your way to Emek Rufayim, which is the, the trendy, uh, the trendy, um, the trendy street in the German colony in uh, southern Jerusalem. It's all of the restaurants and the shopping and all the other things. Uh, you know, the height of, of bourgeois uh, Jerusalem, um, a block away is a large yeshiva called Erloi, uh, which if you go in there, you assume that all these people are Hasidim, because we're kind of narrow-minded and prejudiced like this. We see people that dress in a certain way, we assume that they're Hasidim. They're actually not Hasidim. They're Misnagdim, but they are descendants of the Hasim Sofer and his, and his circle. And the Rosh Yeshiva himself is a direct descendant uh, ben Achar Ben to the to the Hassan Sofer. Uh, so there's a yeshiva that's alive and well, uh, you know, in a rather un, unusual location. And you don't 
I don't even know it's there unless you pass by. When I lived in Yerushalayim nearby to there, I very often used to dive in there on uh, on Friday night in this uh, an Erloy it's called, which is named after a city in uh, in uh, in I assume in Hungary. Um, okay, um, that's the orthodox response to to the reform movement. There was a different response, uh, sometimes classified under the term neo-orthodoxy or new orthodoxy, which comes a little bit later. It comes in the generation after the Hasim Sofer. This is usually most closely associated, of course, with Rav Shimshon Rufel Hirsch. Rav Shimshon Rufel Hirsch. But also, also with Rav Azriel Hildesheimer. I don't think we'll have a chance to talk tonight about Rav Hildesheimer. It's interesting. Rehov Hildesheimer, Rehov Hildesheimer is in Yerushalayim, which is also parallel to Emek is uh, maybe a hundred feet away from the building of the yeshiva of these descendants of the Chasim Sofer. So it's interesting how how that works out. I don't think that there's a Rehov Hirsch. I don't think that any place in Yerushalayim uh, there's a street named after Rishim Shunifel Hirsch, which seems strange to me. It seems strange to me that there wouldn't be a street. But, but uh, I don't believe that there is. Um, that German law required that all Jews belong to a single religious community, meaning that the religious that the that the Jewish community be organized under one auspices. Um, that's still true, by the way, or it was true until not long ago in England uh, that the United Synagogue, headed by the chief rabbi. Uh, was the representative of the Jewish people in in England in the in the United Kingdom? Now it's been liberalized somewhat, and there are other uh, there are other um, there are other uh, the other denominations have taken on a bit of a st- stronger uh, role there. But German law required that all the Jews that there only one when the German government wanted to deal with the Jewish community, it wanted one body or representative to to function with. Once the reform became the most numerous, by definition, they became the representatives in Germany of the Jewish community. In 1847, the German government allowed a separate, in other words, an orthodox uh, uh, minion within the communal structures. In other words, this idea that there could only be one organized Jewish community was obviously not tenable. So very quickly the tables get turned and it becomes the orthodox community that has to start lobbying for 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 equal rights as it were. Um, they uh, um, in 1849 in 1849 uh, in Frankfurt Frank Frankfurt am Main. There are two cities in Germany named Frankfurt, and they're differentiated by which river they sit on. So there's Frankfurt on the Main River, and there's Frankfurt on the Oder. Frankfurt am Oder and Frankfurt am Main. So in Frankfurt on the Main, um, uh, congregation Adat Yishurun, Adas, Adas Yishurun, or Adat Jeshurun, sometimes written in English, is formed, and in 1851, 1851, Rav Shimshon Rafael Hirsch, who was then, uh, you know, a young man, he was in his early, early 40s, uh, is appointed the rabbi of Adas Yishurin. Sometimes in America, the descendant of that shul still exists uh, in a shul in the Washington Heights, uh, New York, and Upper Manhattan. Um, and it has branches el- elsewhere. It's now called K A J K A J. They also actually do some hashkacha work. They they do kashra supervision, and their symbol on a package is is a K A J, Kahal Adat Yishurun, 
uh, named after this original shul from the 1840s in uh, in Frankfurt. Rav um, Shimshon Falharis becomes the rub of this shul. He's a incredibly dynamic personality. I always say, I mean, I mentioned this last week. It's hard to it's hard to tell sometimes from these pictures. Although this picture of Azriel Hildesheimer has has some personality to it. Uh, but these pictures where you had to sit very still while the aperture of the camera was open for a long time, uh, you had to sit very, very still for a couple minutes. Um, so usually that meant people had to like just clench their jaw and stare out into mid distance and you get a you get a uh, an image like this this one, which this this is the the well known uh, portrait of Shimshon Fell Hirsch. Um you know, you can't see the uh, the personality. You can't see the charisma. Everybody always looks so harsh in these in these photos. He was very dynamic. He's a great optimist in the face of terrible pessimism about the options for orthodoxy for Torah true Judaism, and he formulates this notion of a neo orthodoxy, a, a new a new uh, image. Of a of a proud Orthodox Jew, um, he as opposed to as opposed to um, as opposed to the Chassam Sofer, he formulates this this notion of Torah in Derech Eretz, which is a Talmudic notion. It's a, this this phrase already appears in the Mishnah in Avot. Uh, the exact meaning of the phrase in its original context is is not as important as the notion of uh, that that Shmuel for Hirsch gave to it. Um, the exact meaning of Torah im der Heretz has been interpreted and reinterpreted in different ways, but a notion that Torah that a religious life can be part of a life that also includes a larger world. That these things can go hand in hand. They're not natural enemies. That there's a, a form of synthesis, a form of encounter, a form of, well, fill in the blank. What that is is difficult. You know that a number of years ago, 20 years ago already, Rabbi Norman Lamb from Yeshiva University wrote a book called Torah Umada. It's an important book for anyone interested in these. In these, oops, one second. Uh, his book is called Torah Umada. I think I wrote that in yellow. Let me change the color. Um, I'm sure you can get it on uh, on Amazon still. Um, I'm having trouble with the board here. One second. There you go. Torah Umad. I think it has two Bs. It was originally published by Jason Aronson. Uh, Alan will post the link for us. Uh, he wrote this book called Torah Umad. Torah Umad is the slogan of Yeshiva University, which also literally means Torah and Mada, either meaning specifically science or generally speaking. Um, sec, uh, general wisdom, uh, and he wrote this book that outlined. There you go, thank you, Alan. Uh, Torah Mada. Uh, the, hold on, let me let's look at that for a second. Um, and the book outlines, I think, I think, the encounter of religious learning and worldly knowledge in the Jewish tradition is the. Um, is the subtitle. I see it's very expensive on Amazon. It sells for almost $42 on Amazon. So that seems like a lot of money, but you can probably you know, get it at a local library, a local Jewish library, that is, or a shul library, or things like that. Um, so Rabbi Lamb wrote this book, which out Lined the history of different models of the interaction between Torah and secular wisdom or Torah and general society. 
And he, one of the models that's outlined, of course, is from Shemuel Hirsch and Torah and Derek Eretz. Um, there were, of course, uh, schools of thought that strongly opposed the interaction between Judaism and general culture and general knowledge, and others that were more welcoming. Shemuel Rafael Hirsch is an early advocate, at least in the modern period, certainly in uh, in um, in the Ashkenazi world, that said that Judaism can be engaged in in the world, and this is part of his attempt to create this this new image of of a of a of a, a Jew who's loyal to the tradition, but is also engaged larger German world. Again, after the emancipation, there's no other option. Uh, you can't, as we've said a few times, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. And when the only option was that you were Jewish, and therefore you had to be a member in good standing of the of the traditional community, and your only other option was to convert to Christianity, so that set very clear boundaries. After the emancipation, that's no longer true. And um, uh, the, the, after the emancipation, it's no longer true. And the Shemeshim Farrell Hirsch understands that there's a necessity to, there's a necessity to create a, an image of Judaism that can keep people in the fold, and yet also accept the realities that the world has changed and that the encounter with general society, with secular learning, with, with, with simply with earning a living is, is necessary. I see that, that uh, Refoil posted a link to much better priced copies of Rabbi Lamb's book starting at $4.28. Um, so you could also try that out. Uh, try that out there. There's one copy for sale at four dollars and twenty-eight cents, and then a bunch of copies in the low twenty dollars. So that's worth your that's worth your checking out. Uh, Linda writes: After the emancipation, there's a tradition that started where the challenge was to have more money and be reform or be a true Jew and be poor or poor. That was certainly a component of it. The economic was certainly was certainly a component of it, although I don't think that was only it. There was also a sense of pride of what it meant to be a Jew. Uh, that if meant if being a Jew meant that you were backwards, and there was an, uh, an aesthetic component that was lacking, and there was a worldly component that was lacking. These were all disincentives to remaining true to true to to Torah and to Judaism. Um, and he makes an argument. That in the encounter with general, uh, with general, um, with general, let's say with general literature, for example, um, that it's not an outside goal, but that when you read literature, you should read it as a Jew, a Jew who can appreciate the secular, modern, modern uh, world, uh, modern dress. Uh, um, I mean, it's hard to tell by looking, by comparing these two pictures, but the, but the, the, uh, Shemshinov Hirsch is wearing modern clothing. Um, you know, that in, in, uh, in, uh, in Yiddish, we call German Jews yekis. Does anybody know what the, what the origin of that of that phrase is? Well, ja I mean, the word yeki means jacket, but why are they called, why does that become the nickname? The term yeki literally means jacket. Right, correct. So nowadays, we think that the uh, the stereotype of a yeki is somebody who's very kind of a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit repressed. Uh, very proper, always you know has their jacket on. So uh, that's a that's a misnomer, that's a mistake. 
to think that they're called yekis because they always kept their jacket on. You never saw them in their shirt sleeves. No, they're called yekis jacket because um, because they wore a short jacket, like what we call today like a suit jacket, a suit jacket that only comes down to you know shortly below your waist instead of wearing a kipata, you know, like a, a, the long the long garment of the chassidim. So they're called yekis to differentiate them from chassidim or from other, even even the, the chassim sofer was not a chassid, but they, the traditional community, dressed in a certain distinct way with the long kaftan or the long the long, uh, clo- the long, uh, the long uh, coat, the long overgarment. And the yekis, the German Jews, dressed in modern dress, which was a short coat or a jacket. And that's why the other Jews, again, another example of of your your oppositional group choosing the name by which you're called, they're called Yekis. One of their more distinct features was their acceptance of of modern dress. Um, he puts forth a notion of halachic Judaism that's in harmony with modern society. In his very well-known commentary on the Torah, Shemshon of Hirsch was very prolific. Um, much of his writing was focused on explicating and furthering these agendas. He has a wonderful commentary on the Torah, which all of his writing, by the way, is done in German because he's addressing a he's addressing his audience. But it's been translated into Hebrew and, of course, into English. His commentary on the Torah, uh, which has a lot of very interesting uh, Hebrew work, he's doing a lot of um, etymological analysis of the Hebrew language. Uh, but he also making these these kinds of larger points. So let's say on there's a pasuk in Parshas Achremos in Vayikra. I apologize, I don't have it up here on the board for you. It's Vayikra uh, 18:4. Chapter 18, verse 4 in, in Vayikra, et mishpotai ta'asuv et chukotai tishmarula lechet bahem, uh, ani Hashem. Pasuk says, you should do my mitzvot, uh, you should keep my, my statutes, my, my chukim, in order to lechet bahem, to walk in them. Uh, and he makes this point that everything is lalechet, that everything, whatever we do, is in order to to walk when we go out, when we go out into the world, we're walking in God's commandments. The way we conduct ourselves in business, the way we interact with other people, the, the when, when we walk into the university classroom to study biology or literature or history or or, or, or whatever it is, everything that we do is in order to lalechet bahem, to walk in in the mitzvot, in the ways of Hashem. Um, the, the, the goal of Torah in Derech Eretz is to produce a Judaism that, that more properly understands itself. Um, the goal isn't culture per se, culture for culture's sake, but a, a closeness to a closeness to Hashem. Um, here, so here's that's the real that's the real the real rub, that's the real chidush of Torah and Derech Eretz. It's to use Jewish culture, not Jewish culture, to use general culture as a tool to come close to Hashem, to come close to God. And not just as a type of apologetic tool by which we're trying to convince people that are tempted by the reform to say that Judaism can also be palatable, but as as a way to really make a statement about how we relate to the the larger world. He himself. Uh, Bilharsh himself is university educated uh, in, in Bonn, the University of, of uh, Bonn. 
he, in 1836, one of his early works is a collection of letters called the, in English it's called the 19 Letters. We're going to look at a selection from that either tonight or next time. These are, these are um, 19, they're, they're 19 short essays. Um, here it is, first the 19 Letters. This is an older edition of the English version. Uh, I, I I know that there's a newer edition that was published a couple of years ago by Feldheim that is a new translation and a new with uh, some kind of introduction and running commentary, which I, I believe is superior to this uh, older version that I I had at my uh, disposal to Xerox from. Um, and there there are 19 short essays about topics in in Jewish life and the culture and they're, they're a type of, you know, not apologetic, but trying to explicate, uh, you know, Judaism's position on a, on a variety of, of issues. They're written in the form of letters to an interlocutor named Benjamin or Benjamin. Um, it's not clear that these were actual letters. It could be that he he just uh, chose the the dialogical voice of a letter writer, which which by the way many other people, you know, have done as well. Um, uh, the more Nevuchim, the guide to the perplexed of the Rambam, is actually uh, uh, technically speaking, it's a it's a letter, it's a long treatise that's in response to the questions of one of the Rambam students of, of uh, Yehuda ben Yosef, uh, Yosef, uh, Yosef uh, ben Yehuda. Lahavdil, um, uh, C.S. Lewis's uh, screw tape letters uh, uses the same, the same device. Uh, these letters back and forth between a, uh, a, a master and a student uh, in order to, um, in order to spell out uh, certain ideas. The idea of letter writing is a uh, you can say something in a letter. You can accept. You can take on a certain tone in a letter that you wouldn't if you were just kind of spelling out a philosophical uh, a philosophical thesis. And it's it becomes much more engaging. The voice, the authorial voice, is much more engaging. And insofar as he's trying to reach, you know, the masses, the popular readers, it, it, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting device. Even uh, think about it. Even the Kuzari, which is not written as a, as a letter, but as a dialogue, Yehuda Halevi could have written everything he wrote in the Kuzari as a standalone philosophical work. But it's so much more engaging because it's written as a dialogue between the king and the rabbi. I, I, I trust that you know the, you know, the, 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 general, the general thrust of how the Kuzari is set up. If not, I can address that. Um, uh, so that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the 19 letters, uh, which, is, which is first written in 1836. Um, it's it's a polemical work. It has apparently a, a profound impact on German Jewish youth. Uh, it provides a a focus for an intelligent examination of traditional Judaism in the light of modernity and modern issues and problems and challenges. In 1837, he he releases a the 19 Letters is a small a small little volume. It's, uh, each essay is a number of pages. I don't think that any of the essays are more than uh, the longest essays. I think are, are maybe ten pages. Some of the shorter ones are only a couple of pages. Um, in 1837, he releases a, a work called Choreb. In English, I think it's translated as Horeb, H-O-R-E-B. Choreb, of course, being the nickname for Har Sinai, for Mount Sinai. And that's a much more um, that's a much more straightforward uh, philosophical work, in which he is making an argument for for the via 
responsibility of halacha in the modern world. Um, he has also there uh, very many attempts to do ta'ameh ha-mitzvot, to explain the, the meaning and the symbolism and the rationalism and the, the rationale of various uh, mitzvot and, and rituals. Uh, he also does that quite a bit in his commentary on the Torah. So also, in addition to the commentary on the Torah, he writes a commentary on Tehillim, on the Psalms. Uh, he writes a commentary on the Siddur. Um, all of these, all of these, um, all of these things are, you know, are still with us. Ezra. Yes. Ezra, are you there? You getting yes. me? I'm here. Uh, okay. You see, Howard's having some trouble. Perhaps you can be in touch with him. Okay. Um, um, all of these, all of these works are are classic works, still used and read today. Um, worth your, worth your, certainly worthy of your time and attention. Any of these, any of these works by Rosh Hashanah and Froh Hirsch. Um, he he's an opponent of the reform in the same way that the Chassam Sofer is an opponent of the reform, uh, so is the Shimshon of Hirsch, but he does admit very candidly that certain, um, certain external aspects of Judaism, not halachic components, but certain, uh, certain external aspects of Judaism do need to be reformed, uh, do need to be made, do need to undergo a modernization in order to in order to um, engage the the modern the modern Jew modern Jew and to give him the mechanism by which to stay true to the halacha. This is certainly true for the uh, for the aesthetic of public prayer. Remember, this is one of the things that the reform movement put on their was their flagship initiative to modernize the synagogue, the temple. As they as they called that, we discussed that last time. And Rav Shimon Hirsch admits that the, that the the prayer service needs to be made more uh, more of an aesthetic uh, experience in order to keep Jews coming to shul, in order to facilitate their their adjustment to to, to modern uh, society. At the same time, he adamantly rejects the idea that the reforms that the halacha itself should be reformed. He he agrees that there are certain external things that need to be given a facelift, uh, but no reforms of let's say the basic uh, principle. He's of course a strong uh, supporter of of secular education. He's also of course a strong supporter of uh, patriotism to one's. Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, Howard, we can hear you. Um, he's a strong uh, proponent of a patriotic commitment to one's own, one's own, uh, one's own uh, host community, which of course is, you know, harkens back to Napoleon's Sanhedrin and the discussion of what the Jew's role is within his host community. Is he there as a member in good standing, uh, equal to his brother citizens, or is he just the fifth column waiting to, to leave? Because of this, although the Zionist movement did not get going in by any stretch of the imagination in full swing in Rupert Schumpfer's lifetime, the nascent uh, the nascent Zionist movement, or the proto-Zionist movement, uh, that did exist in his time, he was not uh, a strong advocate of. Although he was, uh, in many places, he writes very um, passionately about the singularity of the land of Israel. He is not a um, he is not a fabrent Zionist. Uh, a, a uh, impassioned Zionist, a political Zionist, in the sense of making an argument that the Jews should return to Eretz Israel in order to regain sovereignty 
of themselves and their own affairs. And that's consistent with the nature of the times in which he was living. Uh, I had hoped tonight to get to it, but perhaps next time we'll read this short, uh, this short piece in the 19 letters. You can download it from the website or from the email that went out uh, at the end of last week, or you can email me directly if you if you uh, if you can't manage to do any of those, and I will email the text to you. I just put the um, I just put my email address in the chat box. Um, we'll read this together. In the 19 letters, there are actually two pieces. There are two letters that deal with reform. This is actually the shorter of the two pieces. Um, and you'll see what he's talking about. It would be, I've given it away, but you know, here in Israel it's quite popular, the notion of the unseen. In Hebrew we call it the unseen. I don't know why we don't have a good Hebrew word for it, but in Hebrew we call it by its English name unseen to give a, you know, it's like a homework assignment or a test where you give a text and you ask people some questions about the text to help them understand what it is. I, I recall teaching high school giving this text out, asking uh, the students to try to understand what is this person talking about? What's his attitude? What's his, what's his background? What's he advocating? Um, it, it's quite fresh. It's quite innovative. And it doesn't fit in with the models that we know up until now, up until the 19th century. Uh, you read it. It helps you appreciate. For us, it's a little bit passé. We are all modern, uh, no matter how today, no matter how right-wing one is, uh, it's, it's a different reality. Um, and we all live, um, we all live in, in the, you know, we are all moderns now. And our encounter with the general world is, uh, you know, can't be compared to the isolation that pre-modern Jews lived in. Uh, even Haredi Jews today, certainly Haredi Jews that live in Chutzlaretz, but even Haredi Jews that live in Eretz Yisrael, where you can maintain a certain level of isolation, it's, it's simply not the same as it was um, in the pre-modern era in, in Europe. Um, to understand that is to understand some of the innovation of what Rav Shemshin Frohersh was advocating. Uh, anyone who considers himself any type of form of modern Orthodox Jew, centrist Orthodox Jew, uh, whatever term you're going to choose for yourself, is a descendant of Rav Shemshin Frohersh. Is a descendant of Rav Shem Hirsch, um, and uh, that's uh, that's also significant to uh, it's also significant to recall. In the chat, someone asked me privately about any recommendations on bios of Rav Shem Hirsch. There's a lengthy uh, biography put out, an uh, art scroll actually, quite a number of years ago. Like all art scroll biographies, it has its disadvantages, but it's it's not bad. It's not bad. Um, I think it's probably called Rabbi S. R. Hirsch or Rav S. R. Hirsch, something like that. Um, the cover, of course, is that same stern picture. So next week we will. Oh, there you go. There you go. There's the chat. Um, uh, there you go. Yeah, like Klugman is the author. Um, but of course, you can also read the, it's, you know, start off with the encyclopedia. Start off with the encyclopedia essays on Rav uh, Shemshin Hirsch. Look at the Encyclopedia Judaica. Look at look even at the Wikipedia, and you'll find uh, you'll find things. Uh, so next week we'll read this text, but I ask you, I recommend that you read it first uh, beforehand. And of course, if you have any questions, uh, you can email me during the week. Laila Tov, Shabbat Shalom, all that stuff.